Hey now, welcome to another edition of the Inside BS Show. Today we're talking about your future. That's right. We're talking about what you need to think about as you mature in your business and in your life. The one thing most people are afraid to talk about is how this is going to end for you. I mean, let's face it. We're not getting out of this life alive. So you need to determine what's going to happen to all the stuff you've accumulated during your time here on earth. And you need to tell people what you want them to do if something happens to you. And because we are not good as a human species in talking about these things, I've got someone that I'm going to have this conversation with so you can show them this video or have them listen to this podcast and then you can raise this subject with them yourselves. So this is an essential episode of the Inside BS Show. My guest today is Nina Stillman. Nina, welcome to the show and explain to people why you're the perfect person to talk about this subject. Well, for a couple reasons, Dave, you know, I've been told I'm kind of the queen of BS. So, you know, (laughs) I may challenge you, but also because I am a 30-year veteran of estate planning, business succession planning, charitable planning. You plan for the future. I got gotcha. you. I will help you make sure it comes true uh, in the most tax efficient and um, just plain old the way you want it to go down. All right. So there are there are two times when it makes sense to think about your estate plan. Right. The first time was yesterday and the second time is today. So if you haven't if you don't have a will, let's 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 start with what everybody knows, Nina. Right. The will. Right. You you even when I was a kid, I remember like Bugs Bunny in a cartoon was thought he was going to get killed. So he wrote out a will on a blank sheet of paper. What is what is a will? And why do we need to, why why does everyone, even a single person who's in the prime of their life, why does everybody need a will, Nina? So I will say everybody needs a will. And actually, Dave, it's especially a single person with no children uh, because nobody else knows what they want. Uh, But everybody needs a will for a couple reasons. Number one, if you want stuff to go to your sister and not your brother and not your parents or your Aunt Jenny, you need to tell people where you want it to go. And it's not just your stuff. It's your financial assets. It's your retirement benefits. That's all included. The second reason you need one is because it is the kindest possible thing you could do for your family, especially that single person. Now, unless they are an orphan, which does happen, But again, even more important for them, because someone else is going to have to manage their affairs. But for your family, you're really giving them direction. If you do not have a will, you are guaranteed probate if you own real property and your estate is over $100,000. And most people think, oh, I don't have that much. Well, it's your house, it's your business, it's your bank accounts, it's your life insurance, it's your retirement benefits. Most people easily hit $100,000. Um, that's in the state of Illinois. Other, Other states have different thresholds, and you need to know what the threshold is in your state. But if you don't, the state's going to decide where your stuff goes if you don't. And, you know, probate, I, I tell people all the time, probate is Latin for the biggest pain in the ass you will ever experience. <laughs> Believe me. I will say you, it's probably the second biggest, but, <laughs> but okay. You don't, you don't want your estate to go through probate. And the main reason from a practical standpoint is it costs money. There's, there are legal expenses. It's a huge hassle. If you don't make, if you don't have a will, you're guaranteed to go through probate. But Nina, that's not the only document people should have, right? What other documents should they put in place? At a minimum, you should have a will. You should have a power of attorney for health care or whatever it's called in your state. It might be called a health care directive, which is different than an advanced health care directive or a living will. You also need a power of attorney for property, for your stuff. Uh, you probably should have a living will so that your relatives know what to do and when to pull the plug or when not to pull the plug if that's not your desire. If you're, 
you know, a devout Catholic or or you just really would like to donate organs and you really don't want, um, you know, either way, you need to let people know how you want to be treated if you cannot speak for yourself and when it is okay to terminate your life if you're not coming back to a meaningful situation. Uh, those are the basics to have in place. I also throw in a HIPAA release, which is the document that allows your doctors and your insurance companies to share your medical information. And in the event, gosh forbid, that there is a question of malpractice, you need that HIPAA release to get the documents that you need or your family needs to prove that there might have been a problem. Okay, so somebody comes to you and they sit down, they do all these documents with you. And then what's the next step that they tell their family, hey, if something happens to me, you call Nina. Is that how is that how it works? And then you, you know, when they call you and they say, hey, Dave Lorenzo got hit by a bus, you have all his documents and then you you move forward and take it from there. Is there like a, then there's like a formal do you like sit down with them and do a formal? Hey, here's the reading of the will. OK. All right. So explain explain that process. There's no technical reading of the will, mm -hmm. but the people that are named in the will get to know what's in it and what is coming to them. And basically, if, if all Dave Lorenzo has is a will, yeah, we're going to sit down and reevaluate what assets he had when we made the documents and what assets he has now and see what the next steps will be. If we have things like if Dave Lorenzo's married and his house is titled jointly with his spouse, we may not have to go to probate because that can go directly to the spouse if everything else is is settled, but usually it's not. Usually everything isn't settled and we may need to go to court. The other reason you use probate is to make sure that all taxes are paid, all bills are paid, things like that. The alternative to a will is what's called a revocable trust. Some people call it a living trust. It is a trust that holds your asset. You, uh, as the person who makes the trust, are able to sign all the documents. It's your money. There's no restriction. What that does for you is that helps you avoid probate, but it also helps you in the event that Dave Lorenzo gets hit by a bus, and he's still with us, but he can't really manage his assets for himself anymore. He hit his head too hard, but he's still with us, and he's still doing the BS show. He just can't count the money anymore. <laughs> We we might we might need to do that right away. <laughs> then someone he loves or trusts can manage his assets for himself and you also most likely wouldn't have to have a conservator or a guardian appointed for Dave. So it's, there's a lot of different things. Uh, whether you need one or not depends on a lot of different factors, and that's why you need to talk to an attorney. A lot of people ask me, this is one of my most important points, um, a lot of people say, well, can I just get the same thing online? Can I do legal Zoom? Well, you can do legal Zoom, and you're going to get what you pay for. Yeah, and the I, problem with, with legal Zoom and those services is they're not lawyers. They're not practicing law. They are form-filling programs. You fill out a form, and whatever you fill out comes out in the document. You may have done it incorrectly. They can't tell you. If you want to talk to a lawyer, you have to pay more. So why don't you just go to the lawyer in the first place and get the right plan set up for you? Well, and that's the thing. The documents are are crap. The documents are nothing. It's the plan that you're that you want. It's the plan that you're paying for. So like I'm paying for your 30 plus years of expertise. I'm not paying for the paper that you write down that plan on. So, you know, when you know, if I if I have an issue Am I going to call LegalZoom and they're going to they're going to say, oh, Dave, you know, let's let's update those documents. No. But if I if I buy another asset and I don't want it titled in my name, I can go and I can say, Nina, you know, can we set up a, a trust that can own or hold this asset so that, you know, it's protected in case something happens? I mean, that's the value in working with a lawyer. I, that's you know, it drives me nuts because I'll be walking up and down the aisles of Staples and you'll see Staples sells like a document that's a will and it's basically a fill in the blank thing and i'm and i think to myself how is this first of all how is this not unlicensed practice of law or how is this not you know how is this not 
blatant malpractice because this thing isn't it's not worth anything. It's basically it's hints. It's like a trail of breadcrumbs leading to something. It's not a plan. It's not something that is custom made for you. If you have any assets at all, anything beyond like a pair of sneakers and a television, you need to get your estate plan together. Now, Nina, talk about for us. Um, the other benefit of estate planning, this is my favorite part of estate planning, and this is how I bring it up with my friends, with my family members, and that's for asset protection purposes, right? Oh, we goodness, live, yes. We live in a litigious society, so if you go to somebody like Nina, they can, Nina can help you structure your portfolio of assets. You know, forget about like, like I live in Florida, so pretty my house is pretty much protected. But if I buy any other assets, I need to see somebody like Nina to make sure that, you know, if something happens and I get sued, those assets can't be attached in a lawsuit. Nina, talk about how that works. Absolutely. And you're right, Dave, your house is usually protected no matter what state you live in. There's almost always some sort of homestead law. So they can't really, they can put a lien on your house, which means when you do die and and it gets sold, they're going to take a chunk of that money. But usually while you're living, no one can get to your house. But just about everything else can be gotten. There's lots of different ways, and this is particularly important for business owners. So the structure that we set up depends on what you have, but I use a combination of business entities such as LLCs, corporations, partnerships, S-corporations. My main goal is to limit your risk. Risk um, management is the name of the game here. So we protect your assets with the use of different business entities like an LLC. If you own five rental properties, you're gonna, if you work with me, you're gonna own each one of those in its separate LLC so that if someone slips and falls at property two, they can't try and come after property five, which has no debt on it, and, and get that as well. If they can only get the asset or, or funds related to the asset in that particular entity. That's number one. Number two, we can use what are called irrevocable trusts that will pass assets on to your um, descendants or whomever you wish. And there is a limit on the ability to get at those assets. Now, you may have to give up a little control to get that type of a setup. We may end up going to a different state to set up a kind, a special kind of trust called an asset protection trust. We don't have those in Illinois, but we have them in lots of other places where you can put assets into a trust and protect them from creditors. It's extremely important for professions and professionals who get sued, doctors, lawyers, brokers, um, anybody in a trade any any entrepreneur should be any should entrepreneur be thinking like who this. has a service business anybody should be considering asset protection planning now nina you learned a lot about risk from your dad right you learned from absolutely the, so t- talk about that explain to folks how you i i love the way you you talk about the the education you got from a, being in an entrepreneurial family so explain to folks what we're talking about sure my dad uh was a serial entrepreneur he worked with his best buddy they met at their first uh, the first time they worked together they met and pretty soon after that within a few years they left and formed their own company And they were two um, hysterically funny, loving guys. But the most important thing, number one, was they took care of their people. And number two was risk management. So I learned about those things at a very early age. I jokingly say I got my MBA at the dinner table. And I've known from the time that I was 10 years old to own your real estate separate from your operations and, if possible, separate from your inventory in order to protect those assets from creditors and claims. And, um, you know, they were just really great folks. Uh, When my dad explained to me one time, their business went through a lot of ups and downs. In fact, when I was applying to college, unfortunately, this is how old I am, their comptroller, I don't think those even exist anymore, um, embezzled from those guys about $375,000. And that was in the early 80s. So that was a heck of a lot of money back Mm -hmm. then. And so I was limited to where I could go to college. But what my dad told me, aside from that, um, was he took a cut in salary, if not all. And whenever the company was in a situation where there was a downturn, 
he and his partner would cut their salaries or forego their salaries before their people ever did. And if people had to take cuts so that everybody could stay working, they would work that out. And then they were the last, my dad and his partner were the last to get their salaries restored. So I really learned about putting other people first. Um, to be a leader who lifts from the bottom, not stands on top. I don't care for leaders who stand on top and say, look how great I am. Yeah. <laughs> I really believe you should uh, prop people up and say, look at how great these people helped me make our company. Um, because really, your day-to-day -day folks are the ones who really make your, your enterprises what they are. Uh, people don't leave jobs because they're miserable. They're miserable because of people. They leave people. They don't leave careers. So uh, that I think all of that is great advice. And, um, you know, I, I love the fact that you learned through real life before you went to law school, which tells me that you really understand what it's like for an entrepreneur. Talk about, you know, you, you mentioned special purpose entities for, uh, for specifically for real estate. What other, what other assets do we need to have special purpose entities for it, when it comes to business? Um, well, like I just said, you own your real estate separate from your operations, right. separate from your inventory. So if you're a very, very heavy inventory company, like um, I'm trying to think, let's say you're Morton Salt. And you insure your salt, you insure that inventory, you own that inventory in a separate company. Then you can also move your revenue around based on you buy the inventory from, your operations buys it from the company that holds it. Your operations company pays your real estate company rent. There's lots of different ways. It helps in income taxes, it helps in planning, it helps in who controls your company. You can give financial rights to people without giving them governance rights uh, in any of those entities. So you can do a lot of planning with certain types of entities like an LLC or a limited partnership. Um, there's also, of course, the liability aspect. Uh, I'm trying to think of what else so it, let me give you a let me give you a scenario. Yeah, let me give you a scenario we can we can talk through too. So you're if you're an entertainer or you're like me and you oh, create yeah. and you create intellectual property. My my counsel one. my counsel to folks all the time is you take the intellectual property and you separate it. You have it owned by a separate entity and this way it's completely protected if your operating company gets sued they can't touch the IP. The operating company can go into bankruptcy. The IP the is still there. The perfect example. Can start all over again. Now, here's the, the thing, Nina. The perfect example is Prince. Ah, ex explain. You're uh, Minnesota. Here's where no, Minnesota, Minnesota. Here's where uh, Minnesota pays off. Go ahead. This explain is where what it pays Prince off. Is. So, um, if people don't know, I'm from Minnesota. I've been watching Prince since I was in high school in the early '80s. He was only a few years older than me, um, and I know where his house was. I was seeing him at. Um, First Avenue, the concert shots, some of my friends were there. So here's the deal. Prince did not have any estate planning documents, which for various reasons, mostly his religious reasons, he was a Jehovah's Witness and didn't think he was going to die. They believe in life going on ever after. That's fine. I don't have a problem with that. So in the alternative, what should have been done, in my personal opinion and my professional opinion, is companies, whether they're LLCs or partnerships or whatever, should have been set up to manage his IP, all of his music, all of his business entities, all of the things that created revenue for his family. They're still fighting to this day. And he died years ago like six years ago, I want to say, uh, five or six years ago, and they're still fighting. It's still not settled. I saw some people, some of the letters from crazies who claim to be his relatives. They, they were literally had mental health issues. Um, I know a couple of the attorneys on the case. Uh, it, it was nuts. And if they had just set up some, if his management had been wise enough to consult an attorney and just set up some entities, they could have still been employed because they would have helped manage the assets. The assets would have generated revenue, which that's what would have been distributed, not the stuff itself. Um, it, it's just unbelievable, particularly with IP, like 
copyrights, patents, um, trademarks, all those things can be licensed, and which that's is what, the other thing. how they the, generate yes. the money. So every so time you hear Purple Rain played somewhere now, any Prince song played somewhere now, there's money made off of that. And now it just depends on who it's going to. Okay, so I want you to, uh, I want you all to think about this. There is that structure. It's that's one of my favorite things having, you know, having a separate entity own your IP or having a separate entity own your inventory or putting your high risk assets in a separate entity. That structure works, but there's one thing that I know of and maybe many more that Nina will share with us that can trip you up in that structure. And Nina and I are going to talk about that in just one second. I need to remind all of you that our show is brought to you by Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. Now, we're talking with Nina about asset structuring and um, asset entity structuring and the allocation of assets. After you hire someone like Nina to do your documents or you work with Nina to get your asset protection structure set up, there's some complex accounting that may take place. And Sandrowski are the perfect people to call because they will keep everything on the straight and narrow for you. It is really difficult when you're an entrepreneur to handle all the nuances of finances of multiple entities. You can hire someone internally, and as you get more complex, you should hire someone internally, but you always need expert advice when it comes to tax planning. For over 35 years, Sandrowski Corporate Advisors has done all sorts of tax planning. They're even experts in family office advisory. So for those of you who don't know, Affluent people, high net worth individuals will often set up what's called a family office, which is a company that manages all of those assets for them. Well, Sandrowski wrote the book on that. So if you are involved with a family office or you're involved with complex tax planning or you need business valuations or litigation support or forensic accounting, Sandrowski Corporate Advisors are the people to call. Here's what you can do. You can reach out to them at 866-717-1607, 866-717-1607. Sandrowski Corporate Advisors, they're a CPA firm with a truly different perspective. We're also brought to you by My Revenue Roadmap Guide. If you're in professional services and you want to grow your business, I've got a free gift for you. Now, why am I giving you something for free? I'm a for-profit business, but I appreciate you being a viewer, being a listener of the show. So go to revenueroadmapguide.com, revenueroadmapguide.com, enter your contact info, and you can download the same plan I share with my clients. You can customize it for yourself. You can grow your book of business. And look, if you're a lawyer and you're working at a law firm, I know you're going to stay at your law firm forever, right? Of course you are. But on the outside chance that you want to go somewhere else, wouldn't it be nice to have a portfolio of clients that you can take with you? That would give you a lot of flexibility. It would give you negotiating leverage. Go to revenueroadmapguide.com, download your free business development plan today. Okay, Nina, so the one thing that I know that can screw this whole plan up right? Is if you don't fully fund these trusts, if you don't set them up to be independent entities, right? You just sign the paperwork. You go see Nina, you sign the paperwork and Nina says, all right, put the money in the bank account and you don't even set up a bank account for the trust, right? That's the one thing I know that can just blow this whole thing up. What else could screw this up for us? Well, that's the main one. And I will tell you, Dave, any lawyer who's worth their salt is going to check in with you to make sure you've done it or they're going to help you do it with their paralegals and make sure it's done right because otherwise you just paid a whole lot of money for a basically a ream of paper and that's not that's not good practice of law and we don't want that to happen to our clients we want to see the plan uh, enacted we want to see it work down the line the other things that can mess it up are if you change assets if you don't check in with your lawyer if you hear about something in the news and you go, uh-oh, I just did something like that, it'll be okay. It's not going to be okay. Mm -hmm. Check with your lawyer. That's what we're here for. The biggest issue that I see business owners, or mistake, frankly, that I see business owners make is they don't want to call the lawyer because it's going to cost too much. Well, it's going to cost a heck of a lot more if there's a mistake and you don't catch it early. 
and can do something proactively. If you wait till, gosh forbid, you pass away in the chair, because no business owner is going to actually retire. They're just going to die in the chair, right? If you wait till that time, then your family has to clean up the mess. Don't wait. Talk to your lawyer. It's a relationship. Getting an estate plan done, having your business succession plan done, even just your business lawyer, it's not a one-off transaction. This is a relationship. And you should be checking in. Your lawyer should be checking in with you. When they find out about law changes, they should be sending out letters to you. You should be hearing from them. This is not a once a every couple of years thing. My biggest clients and I talk, I would say on average, once a month. Yeah, I, I think that's great advice. That's and the biggest thing. I, you know, I, I think it's great advice. And I think anytime there's a life event, they certainly should be checking in with you. I would put it on my calendar if for no other reason than to to make sure that your documents were still up to date to have at least an annual review. I know, looks, I know so many people who they, they'll sit down with you and then it takes them three, four, five months to sign their documents. And like the whole world could change in the time period it right. takes. I mean, for I, them to I have a client them. right now who we started working on their stuff they're an interesting couple. They're from their green card holders in the U.S. They're great. They're entrepreneurs um, worth quite a bit of money. And they're from another country in the Caribbean. And he, unfortunately, um, contracted shingles. And we haven't been able to finish his plan because he can't do much. And so we're waiting. And that's even, you know, in the pandemic where we're doing everything via Zoom. Zoom, yeah. So, um you know, don't wait. Things can happen. And God, thank goodness he's okay from the shingles. But God forbid he had contracted COVID and died. He wouldn't have a complete plan. No. Yeah, and you don't. No, nobody. That's the, that's, the, that's the scenario that would keep me up at night, right? We started the plan and then I got sick and I didn't finish it. And right. you don't. You, you, like something that's half done is almost worse than having nothing. Um, right. And they have 10-year-old twin kids. Oh, geez. I mean, it would be a nightmare. All right, Nina, talk about uh, when people get divorced, right? So yes. you're, you're, you're married and your documents were done together. I mean, the minute the ink is dry on your divorce, you got to get in Nina's office. Maybe even while you're waiting for the ink to dry, you get into yes, Nina's office. Yes, I've had many clients come in while they're waiting for the judge to sign. They're pretty much done. And we've started drafting because they know what they want. We don't sign it until the until the judge signs the decree, but we do definitely start drafting to make the changes. Older wills may say, or documents may say, my spouse, Bob Smith. Well, you're not married to Bob Smith anymore, but it doesn't mean that it's going to go to your new spouse. It doesn't mean it's not going to go to Bob's spouse, if Bob Smith, if you're not remarried. You have to take care of that. You really have to have that in your documents. You want them updated. It may say, if no, none of the people I've named have survived me, then my assets go half to my heirs and half to my spouse's heirs. Well, even if you're not married, half of your stuff could end up going to your former spouse's heirs if nobody else is around that you've named. Gosh forbid it's Christmas and the house blows up. Mm -hmm. That's a big problem. You need to update your documents. There's usually going to be also uh, some concerns for insurance ownership. You may have to buy an insurance policy on your own life when mm -hmm. you get divorced in order to provide for your spouse and children. And if you do that, it changes your net worth. Whenever you own life insurance on your own life, it affects your net worth. You are considered to own the death benefit. So if you need to buy a million dollar policy because you have four kids and you have to provide for their college educations and a little money for your spouse, your former spouse, if you die, your net worth just went up by a million dollars. You need to get your stuff redone. You need to stay on top of it. Assets can change, tax laws can change, your net worth can change. So with all of those three moving parts, you really need to make sure you get in after a divorce and get up to date. 
So if you have minor children and I'm, I don't know the answer to this. I'm asking, I'm thinking out loud here, right? So you have, you have minor children and you're, uh, I mean, I, I say minor children, not, 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 not that I'm, I'm minimizing the children. They're, they're, no, uh, they're, they're below the age, age of majority. Yes. Right. <laughs> so you have, you have minor children and you, you have a $3 million policy because if something happens to you, the children have to be raised, and then they, the, the college has to be paid for. You could take that, uh, and I'm asking, I'm not, I'm, not say, I'm not telling, can you take that life insurance, make the beneficiary a trust, you create the trust, and then you have clear direction in the trust, listen, this person is gonna be named as the trustee, here are how the funds are to be distributed over the course of that. So that, that makes the most sense to me, so that, listen, and then if we get divorced, the life insurance is still in the trust, so I don't care, what, I don't have exactly. to deal with that. And you would do that whether you're married or single or not. And the other thing, I was just thinking the fact that you brought, that we were talking about kids. The other thing when you're getting divorced is you may have appointed um, your former spouse's parents, siblings, whomever to be the guardians of the kids. And that may not be your wish anymore. So now, usually, now you hate them. So you don't right, want the kids know, going. Or, or they hate you, depending <laughs> on who did what to whom. Um, so the case may be where it's not appropriate any longer. It may be, it is appropriate. Maybe you do still like right. them, you and the spouse grew apart, that's fine. But if it's not appropriate, usually what the document for a divorced person will say is in the event of my death and any of my children are minors, if their remaining parent cannot or will not be the guardian, maybe the remaining parent isn't around anymore, maybe they're disabled, who knows, um, then you need to name new guardians for your kids if they're minors. Mm -hmm. And that, you know, it happens a lot, actually. It's a really sad state of affairs. If, gosh forbid, one of you is disabled, you still love each other, you may still live together, but you may have to get divorced in order to qualify for Medicare. Mm. Interesting. Because you have to destitute yourself. Mm -hmm. So, in that situation, you need to be very, very careful about who you appoint as guardians for kids, where you leave assets, um, that's a little bit different kind of planning than I generally do, but there are specialists who do that. So if one of you uh, in a couple becomes disabled, really to a point where you're not going to be able to work, you qualify for disability, and it could be fatal, you, you need to think about your means and the cost of supporting the other person, and you should consult with someone about what is the best way to proceed. Because there's a lot of couples, and you'll see this a lot in very old couples, uh, in their 80s, 90s, where one has to go into a nursing home, where they get divorced so they can qualify to um, get Medicare benefits. And they could also take their assets and put them in an irrevocable trust that would be, no, that's not going to work? That wouldn't work? Depends. It depends on the level of means that you have. It depends on what your net worth is. You are not allowed to transfer your assets away from the government, mm. essentially. That's okay. why you have to get divorced. You're also not allowed to... Um, to put assets into an irrevocable trust if you can't afford to support yourself. You can't put all of your assets in. They're going to come back into your estate. And then you're going to be stuck with this. Uh, that's a really bad situation because you're stuck with this irrevocable trust. It can't be changed, but you're still going to get taxed as if you own those assets, but yeah, you can't get to them. That's, that's, the, that's worst the worst of both scenario. worlds. Yeah, no, you <laughs> right. don't want that. You're still going to be taxed as if you own them. That's a big problem. And again, you know, sounds like a great idea, but you need to consult with a professional before you do these things. Uh, and you need to know what the correct way to proceed is. Okay, so I want to uh, I want to take a minute here, and I'm going to put this in the show notes as well, and remind you that we're having a conversation with Nina Stillman, and she's a licensed attorney in Illinois. I think you're also licensed in Minnesota, right? She's licensed in Illinois and Minnesota, but she's not giving you legal advice here today. So don't be a knucklehead and think this is legal advice. This is an informational show. If you need legal advice, go hire a lawyer. Don't cheap out. Go hire a lawyer. All right, Nina. So now I want you to talk a little bit about 2021. Um, you had a challenging year in 2021. Tell the folks who are listening, tell the folks who are watching what you went through and tell them the reason why you want to share this information with them. Absolutely. So in 2021, 
Uh, I was humming along. It was going to be a breakout year. Even with COVID, I was doing great. And then I went to the doctor on January 15th, and I no longer ever go to the doctor on January 15th. That is permanently a spa day in my calendar. Um, in 2020, I had a TIA on January 15th. Mm. And in 2020, which is a mini stroke for people who don't know. And um, in 2021, I went and I had my annual mammogram, which I hadn't had in many, many annuals. So uh, I did go and I have um, been asked to stay behind. I have, uh, you know, I had a bigger chest and sometimes they need to recheck the photos. That's fine. But when she asked me to stay after that, I got nervous. And the radiologist came out to talk to me. I got real nervous. And unfortunately, a couple weeks later, I had a biopsy and I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Now, to preface the story, I'm fine now, I'm cancer free. I was incredibly lucky that it was found very, very early. But I spent 2021 basically having surgery in April. I was diagnosed in February. I was in school. I'm taking uh, LLM tax classes at Northwestern. I finished school. I had surgery April 15th before my finals. I took my finals. I then got started getting treated in May. I had chemotherapy May, June, July, August, and the 1st of September was my last treatment, and then I went back to school. And then I had another surgery, uh, reconstruction surgery in October. And since then, uh, my hair has grown back, as you can all see. It looks great, and it looks terrific. Thank you, and uh, I feel really good. I still get tired. I'm just not even six months out from my last treatment. So that's pretty normal. But other than that, I am blessed and so, so lucky. But I got to tell you, ladies, the more I went through, the more I learned. And men. This does not exclude men. Granted, the numbers are very different. About 230,000 cases are diagnosed a year in women in this country. And about 30,000 women die every year. Uh, and those numbers are on the rise. For men it's much, much lower. About 2,500 cases are diagnosed a year in men, but it can happen to you. And about um, 300 and some die, uh, men die a year from breast cancer. So do your annual, do your monthly checks. The, I was on some uh, Instagram groups and there's things like feel them on the first, feel yourself up Friday, whatever you wanna call it. Please, please, please check your breasts. Please, please, please do not skip your mammogram. I had a hard time getting in. I was supposed to go in 2020 and I got turned down because of COVID. They weren't running anything. And I had to beg my doctor to uh, call, my uh, general practitioner to call and schedule it for me because I got turned down uh, because of COVID. And I, I get it, but I was desperate. I hadn't had one in way too long i'm embarrassed to say probably eight to ten years i hadn't had a mammogram they are annual i still get them i'm going in a couple weeks for my mammogram again and granted i only have to have one checked but but um, i'm happy to have the one uh i could have had none mm -hmm. you need to get yourself checked every single year and the reason is i will tell you if you do not find it early, your situation is not going to be as rosy as mine. Yeah, the 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 cure the cure really is the is the early diagnosis. That's what you're. I would have found it myself. Never mm -hmm. would have found it myself at this stage. And one of my uh, new passions, of, aside of course from breast cancer research and all of that, is really educating young women, because. Uh, the new guidelines from, I think it's the CDC or the AMA or the Breast Health Council or whatever it is, uh, is that you don't need a mammogram until you're 40. That is baloney. Mm -hmm. no, I uh, agree. Young, about 10% of cases of those 230,000, so 23,000 cases are women under the age of 45. And the younger you are when you are diagnosed, the more likely you are to have stage three or four breast cancer because you don't find it till too late because you're told you're too young for breast cancer, you don't need a mammogram. That is bull. Yeah. So in fact, I'm speaking at Northwestern Law School. These young ladies are now my pals 
and I want them to advocate for themselves. And as young lawyers, they need to learn to advocate. And if you can't learn to advocate for yourself, you're never going to learn to advocate for someone else. Yeah, and the other thing when you're when you're younger too, your hormones are are far more active, and that's what really that's what really f- fosters the growth of it. Yeah. And right, and exactly, and it depends on the type you you end up contracting, but. First of all, one in eight women will contract in the United States will contract uh, breast cancer in their lifetime. That that's the statistic currently. It's getting better, but that's look around you, people. Go to the mall and count people. Mm-hmm. One in eight. That's a lot of women. Well, I mean, um, many of us many of us have eight women in our family. How would exactly. you feel if one of them? You know, you, know right. you, you want do you want to pick? I mean, come on. Right. Which you one? Know. Which one? Yeah. Right. And they say that. Oh, it's it's genetic. No, no. Most people, 85% of cases, no one had it in their family. Mm-hmm. It doesn't exist in my family. Right. Uh, we sort of joke, our family is diabetes and strokes. Great. Uh, but we don't have breast cancer. Uh, it is the BRCA gene. They talk a lot about that. The BRCA1 and 2, they are actually gene mutations that are very common. And you can be... You can be tested for that. Yes, yes, yes. I was just going to say that. In mm-hmm. Eastern European women, of which I am one, and I am happen to be Jewish, and it's more prevalent in Eastern European Jewish backgrounds. I don't have it, thank goodness. I got tested because I have a niece and a nephew, and I want to make sure that I they, they don't have it. Mm-hmm. Uh, I do not have it. I'm lucky. But here's the problem. They only talk about BRCA1 and 2. There's seven others. Mm-hmm. There are seven other gene mutations that you could have that give you a greater, much greater increased chance of breast cancer. So my biggest message on this particular point, please, please, please get checked. Do not skip your mammogram. If you are younger than 40 or 45, advocate for yourself to have a mammogram. If your doctor says no, change doctors. I'm not kidding. Change doctors till you find a doctor who will give you one. You may not have to have one every year if your breasts are clean but please get checked. Gentlemen, the signs that you should look for, because you're not gonna go in and get a mammogram, but trust me, men get them. Uh, You should look for any changes in your nipples, any discoloration, and at the worst point, God forbid, any bleeding from your nipples, lumps under your armpits. If they are not happening at a time when it might be humid, uh, Dave, you're in Florida, it gets humid down there a little bit. But if it's not, if it's winter and you're still feeling a lump on your armpit, please go get checked. Please, please, please. It's not anything to be embarrassed about. It's your life. People were, are, say to me, oh, how can you talk about it? Because it was my life. So you'll, you'll notice I wear, I wear a lot of pink ties. I have probably 20 pink ties. I wear pink all the time. And there's a reason for that. Whenever somebody compliments me on my tie or asks a question about my tie, I tell them this story. My father was in his 60s and he um, uh, went on an aggressive weight loss, actually his 70s, his early 70s, went on an aggressive weight loss program, lost a lot of weight. And he was taking a shower and he was washing himself and he felt something unusual in his breast. He went to the doctor and the doctor said, you know, we should, I don't know what that is. You know, his general practitioner, we should have that checked out. And it turns out he had a mammogram and it, and it turns out he had breast cancer. So my parents being um, very typical Italian Catholic parents, it was the end of the world, Right. The whole, you know, uh, I, I mean, look, I'm not, I'm not making light of it. I can make light of it now because he's perfectly fine. But, um, we, and we, you know, we didn't know what to do. Fortunately, I have, uh, I have a very good alumni network in the college I went to, and a graduate of the university I went to happened to be one of the foremost experts on breast cancer in men. I went through my alumni network and called, and actually got my dad an appointment with this doctor. And the doctor, he's since retired. He retired during COVID, but the doctor was amazing. Guided my dad through it. My dad had a, had a mastectomy, had his breast removed, uh, you know, had radiation, didn't need chemo. And he's on tamoxifen now, which is, a, which is a, a medication that he takes. But the thing is, fast forward now to last year during the pandemic, I lost weight and I felt something in my breast. And I thought to myself, oh, shit. 
<laughs> you know, you got, you got to be kidding me. So I immediately that day made an appointment with my doctor. I went and had a mammogram, which is, by the way, it's an interesting experience. God bless you ladies for going through that. Um, yeah. So, uh, but I, I, it turns out mine was nothing. It was, it was just fat. Uh, so, um, but the deal is the minute you notice something abnormal, you got to go get checked out. I can't tell you how many people have told me the story where I, I, I knew it was there, but I let it go. You know, that's the, the, the only thing, the, 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 I shouldn't say the only thing, but the best thing is to get it early so that you don't have to worry about it. Yeah. I mean, I, I will tell you, um, it, my tears are kind of springing into my eyes because I think of you and how scared you must have been and, and what a horror, you know, scary experience for your dad. Men, you know, it, it is scary, but please don't wait. Please don't mm -hmm. wait. And that is the problem with younger women. They, they're told they're too young, so they don't think it's anything. Well, Planned Parenthood, so you can go to a clinic. Like, if you're a young woman, you can go to a clinic, like Planned Parenthood. And yep. I think it's free. I think you it can go. It should be free. I think In it's Illinois, free. it's free. Yeah. Um, every state has their own guidelines, but I'm pretty sure it's free everywhere. It may not be. I don't want to assume. But in Illinois, I know it's free. I think it's free in Florida. Yeah, it's, um, it is. For, we, uh, my, my, my wife was in her 30s. She was she was too young for the insurance to pay for it. She, right. We used to go every October. She would go. So yeah. um, it's so you know. worth it to yeah. know that you're healthy. And at a minimum, ladies, if you are below 40 and you do get one, you have a baseline. Maybe you only need to go every other year or if you feel something weird for a couple of years. But please go get checked. I, I have a girlfriend who I actually met through this Instagram network, and it turns out she's actually a friend of my niece. My niece is a professional dancer in New York. Oh, wow. And this young lady is also a dancer, and they've danced together. And this young lady is 33 years old. She is on her 100 and about 115 treatments, mm. which means chemo, radiation, something or other. She's had metastatic breast cancer since she was 27. She yeah. has been dealing with this for seven years. Most women with metastatic breast cancer, younger or older, don't make it past two or three years. Mm -hmm. Seven years she's been going, and I'm so proud of her, and I love her so much, and just can't support her enough. She's amazing. Um, but this is what it is, man. Your life is taken over, whether it's a short period of time like mine or a long period of time like Maggie's. You don't want to deal with this. Yeah. Um, please, please just get yourself checked. Absolutely. Better. Uh, you could not find better advice. And that, that reminds me. So we're going to do the three things we should take away from the show today. Okay. And I want you to think about three things to take away. I know what one's going to be already. Before <laughs> we get into the three things everybody should take away from the show today, I want to remind you that we are brought to you by Sandrowski Corporate Advisors. They are here for you, whether you're forming a family office or you're getting ready for a big case and it's a litigation matter and you need forensic accounting. They're there for you if you need business valuation, particularly if you're a family law attorney and you have people who are going through divorce. Please reach out to Sandrowski Corporate Advisors at 866-717-1607. Also, get my Revenue Roadmap Guide. It's free, revenueroadmapguide.com, revenueroadmapguide.com. Okay, Nina, the number one takeaway, the, uh, the, uh, let's start with three. The number three takeaway, what's the number three okay, thing number we should take away? The number three takeaway is uh, follow your dreams. Okay. We didn't really get into that, but follow your dreams. Follow your dreams, okay. Number two takeaway. Put your people before yourself. That is my number two takeaway. Put okay. your people before yourself. Put your people before yourself and don't use legal Zoom, okay? Correct. And then <laughs> the number one, the number one takeaway, Nina. The number one takeaway is please get your breasts checked. Please advocate for yourself and your health care. It's your life. Your doctors do this all the time. Um, and they may brush you off. Please don't back down advocate for yourself please 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 take your health very seriously particularly your breast health all right and we're gonna I will say dave one more quick thing please. about sandrowski sandrowski also does great valuations for estate work if you're either planning an estate especially if you have a business there are different valuations for estate planning tax work and divorce so use sandrowski they're fantastic i love them 
866-717-1607. Nina, you can take over the show. That's great. <laughs> Thank you very much, Nina Stillman. It has been such a pleasure having you here. Thank you, folks, for listening. Thank you for watching. We'll see you right back here again tomorrow. Until then, here's hoping you make a great living and live a great life.